Thank you, Arndt. Um, as Arndt said, I work for the United Nations Development Program in New York, uh, and over the last three years, I've been engaged in the process that led to the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in supporting member states, UN member states, in coming up with this um, wonderful uh, new agenda uh, that includes also the Sustainable Development Goals at their core. Uh, and over the last couple of years, this agenda was adopted, as you may know, in uh, uh, 2015, almost exactly two years ago. I, I've been working with colleagues from many parts of the United Nations and other entities in supporting governments around the world in uh, making progress towards implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And so I'm very happy to be uh, chairing the, the first session, which is about the um, thinking through how government can be or should be uh, in 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and I think we couldn't start in uh, a better way than with the Honorable Minister, uh, whom I will invite to come to, to address us in uh, 30 seconds. I just wanted to say that the Minister has had a remarkable career in uh, public service in his uh, country uh, of, of Sri Lanka, in that he has held a number of ministerial responsibility, uh, rep responsibilities over a diverse range of portfolios, ranging from education, energy, industry, environment. You signed, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Paris Agreement on behalf of your country. So in a way, the minister personifies the SDGs because he has been working in so many different areas, and this is what the SDGs are. This is what the 2030 Agenda is. It's a fairly comprehensive and ambitious agenda. And you now hold the responsibility for science, technology, and research, uh, which is the topic of the overall conference. So we look very much forward to hearing from you to help us to think through how to connect the Sustainable Development Goals with the effect of uh, technology in changing the way governments work between now and 2030. Minister, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Mr. Max, Everett Phillips, Director, UNDP Global Center for Public Service Excellence. Uh, Professor Yong Gang Wen of NTU. Uh, Ms. Christine Later, uh, Senior Advisor and Co-Founder, Center for Economics and Public Administration Limited. Panelists, Excellencies, resource persons, ladies and gentlemen. I am happy and grateful for the invitation extended to me as the Minister of Science, Technology and Research of Sri Lanka to address this event of disruptive technologies and the public service excellence. I think uh, when I was introduced, uh, started with my cabinet portfolios, but in 1991, as a practicing counsel in Colombo High Court, I was elected to the uh, municipal council just outside Colombo City as the deputy mayor in 1991. Then within two years, I was elected to the provincial council of the Western Province. Western Provincial Council uh, represent 27 percent of total population of Sri Lanka. That's 21.2 uh, million at the moment. And uh, within next two years, I was elected as the chief minister of the Western Provincial Council. When, then within next two years, I was elected to the parliament and I was given the portfolio of education in the year 2000. So since 2000 to date, I have held different portfolios. There's education, uh, for a short period of time, higher education, 
then petroleum industries, environment, now science, technology, and research. So I have an experience from 1991 in all three tiers of governance in Sri Lanka. That is the local governments, then next tier, provincial council, then the national level. So with that uh, experience and uh, having attended uh, many international conferences uh, and uh, having served as uh, a resource person, as a policy maker, when preparing 17 SDG goals during 2013 and 14. Uh, so then I think I'll be able to add something uh, new to this uh, very important international conference on disruptive technologies and the public service. So while I'm happy to share our own attempts at disrupting in inefficiencies and realizing growth with disruptive technologies, and I will be taking a fair share of knowledge back home from this exposure and infractions. I know that I am in a country which primarily liberate the human resource, the only resource it had effectively and efficiently to today's position of economic strength. 2030 certainly is an interesting year. On one side, the year is built to be the year of the technology singularity when the machine intelligence is going to surpass that of the human. On the other hand, the year will also demonstrate how the world has achieved the SDGs. In my own country, a child entering the education system for the first time now will finish the secondary education in 2030, and he or she will perhaps vote for the first time, allow the political system to continue as it is to select the government of 2030, just 13 years from to date. I'm aware that my own country, Sri Lanka, has one of the largest public sector services on a per capita basis. Our population is 21.2 million by 2017. Our public service size is 1.4 million. So that is why I say uh, the uh, per capita base is uh, quite larger than uh, expected. I know the uh, debilitating power of inefficiency and the stiffening issues from excessive bureaucracy. Public sector innovation is not something we have practice across the public service, though there was the plan last year in our National Productivity Secretariat to launch a national contest. And quite a few examples of innovative implementations do exist. While we may not have succeeded in bringing the much needed efficiency, can you adopt an approach of change via disruptive technologies an approach that is available for us today. Becoming smarter with speed may not allow those who prefer status quo to react and what perhaps was the use of force in the year for pushing an agenda can today be replaced with technologies. I agree with what your former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew stated, I quote, today, the old maps and the old compass are no longer valid, unquote. As a politician, I visualize the government in 2030 of any country will be held accountable based on SDGs. However, what are we doing today will ensure positive outcomes when it reaches 2030. I had the good fortune to sign the Paris Accord on behalf of Sri Lanka, and we are taking strong steps to ensure Sri Lanka in 2030 is going to be an island of accomplishment in our own way. We did well with MDGs 
though SDGs are much more challenging. Our President, His Excellency Maitripala Sirisena, as the head of state, started a separate division at Presidential Secretariat for monitoring SDGs. In this journey, we are embracing disruptive technologies positively and meaningfully. We cannot just blindly consider technology alone as we mitigating climate change too is a must. The good news is that we have started. Honorable Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Ranil Vikram Singh, who visited last year Singapore, introduced a new bill to the parliament to form a Sustainable Development Council under the Ministry of Sustainable Development in our country. We are in Sri Lanka at times not aware of our own possibilities, and this is quite true in the sphere of technologies. Our past was actually rooted in sustainability and our lives were more in harmony with nature. When Sri Lanka became granary of the East, the society introduced the hydraulic civilization along with the concept of not a drop of rainwater will flow into the ocean without being used. The tanks, many thousands of them still standing and serving in the dry zone, are testimony for execution of an idea and the solidity of construction. Around 5th century, we had well-organized hospitals. We also had the best steel produced at one time, which found their way to become Damascus woods, and the means of production was using monsoon winds. I am sure the manner in which these feats were achieved, one would state that those technologies must have been quite disruptive at those times. Disruptive technologies position our ancient society at a position of strength and resilience. They were not looking only at return of their investment only for few generations, but had endured to leave a legacy for centuries to come. We perhaps today in Sri Lanka, grappling with many problems, need to take a step back, pause, and contemplate. Even in science, Interestingly, Sri Lanka, which was known as the Isle of Serendip, has given the word serendipity. We know how important serendipitious discoveries have been beneficial to the humankind. When you look at the history of science and technology outside, I can mention few situations where resources from Sri Lanka have enabled transformations to happen. When Edison was testing his light bulb. Bamboo fiber from then Ceylon gave him the best results. Otto Hahn, in his quest for nuclear fission, found the moderator in the form of Ceylon graphite, and his initial discovery in radiochemistry came from mineral from Ceylon. We have novel slow release fertilizer to support the emerging food security issues, biofilm, fertilizer-based systems, and biochar to get soil fertility back on track. Sri Lanka produced the world's best graphite with 96% carbon. Graphite is getting into advanced batteries, and our own electric car, Vega, is emerging, which has more artificial intelligence on board. Our software and algorithms are powering stock exchanges of the world, travel industry, and eBay, etc. We engage in projects with the societal needs in our minds, but I must admit that we need much more empathy. At times, the service sector completely misses the nuances of innovation and acts with much timidity. Service innovation, especially with the public sector, can be enormously enriching as you will be serving needs and meeting aspirations in double quick time. How many lives get wasted standing in queues 
and with today's technologies, can we justify waiting to be served in lengthy queues? Our answer should be no, and Sri Lanka, we today are going to be different. I sincerely believe and understand the role for and the power of science and technology in transforming Sri Lanka. The need to deploy emerging technologies and the innovative abilities of our scientists and researchers is an imperative today. Sri Lanka, with its widening trade gap, failing export revenue, with the dismal performance in high-tech exports, can only be turned around to investing and ensuring innovation-led economic growth. All developing countries must understand this and should not consider innovation-based economic growth as something beyond their reach. Last year, we had Science and Technology for the Society Forum in Colombo with the participation of over 700 scientists. And as a result of STS Forum, we introduced a vision called Investing, Innovating Sri Lanka. Innovating Sri Lanka will mobilize its entire research and development infrastructure along with strategic investment in this direction. We have 266 Vidata, it means science and technology centers at division secretariat level to promote science and technology at rural level. This program will act as a technology transfer mechanism and today it covers most of the country. I'll ensure that the investments towards research and development is lifted to where it should be as a factor of GDP and also remove barriers for researchers to fulfill their tasks and realize aspirations. All these steps will not violate any of the sustainability principles. I have had time to seek out views of the scientists both in Sri Lanka and abroad on how STI can support STG. I have attended the annual STI for STG review program in New York at UN headquarters a couple of months ago. Our programs such as midwives with tabs at grassroots level, providing island-wide Wi-Fi coverage, toxin-free agriculture across the nation is opening up new possibilities. We have defined all 17 SDGs with STI interventions, considering education as a key, which had been one of our strengths. We have drifted away from the STEM focus. I have initiated a program with a broad coalition of the public sector, a drive to realize 60-40 realization of STEM, arts, and commerce human capital development program. Today, what we have is the complete reverse, and this is not the way to bring about change disruptively and emerging technologies. A serious engagement in human capital development has been initiated. If our systems moving towards 2030 manage to replace the military with a broad enterprising education mechanism, something that Costa Rica has already done, that indeed, would be a sustainable future that we should seek out. To, uplift, to uh, uplift the STEM education, my ministry is engaged in a strong collaborative program with Minister of Education, Minister of Higher Education, and Minister of Vocation Training and Technical Education. I believe that this type of strategic collaborations too is vital for national development. I have witnessed how in Singapore, you value assessment and feedback schemes such as PISA assessments and a strong, educated, enlightened society can do wonders more so than a society which relies on weapons for protection. We see hunger side by side with sophisticated weaponry while we speak of SDG 2, food security. We see falling education systems creating gaps in gender equality. Number five, SDG. 
the world and my view is the stem education and our education in general is that it is a powerful weapon in its own right a weapon that we should use imaginatively as 2030 challenges us to achieve ladies and gentlemen i have initiated a strong professional alliance on science and people to advise me on national issues and directions that needs to be taken time to time workshops and my ministry with the participation of scientists planners and economists conduct seminars and social scientists to review policies and introduce action plan with targets it's a forum to be imaginative and to seek out answers to the future challenges with science standing side by side with the society and for the society there is no space for pseudo science with current programs in personalized medicine robotics genomics biotechnology nanotechnology and artificial intelligence and in space technologies we are determined to change the landscape of sri lanka soon to be a reality the national science center will be a beacon for informal science education we are conscious of our responsibilities to and in this regard all our technology developments and developments will be centered with the national aspirations of a blue green economy which is rooted in sustainable thinking we are entering to the space technology within next 3 years by sending nano satellite in 2020 to the orbit with the help of roscosmos of russian federation we have national institute of fundamental studies focus uh, fundamental research nano technology laboratory and the incubation the vega electric super car is in the pipeline biotechnology lab scheduled to be started before end of this year and the stem education will be the priority it is indeed a pleasure to inform you that we have launched our social innovation lab in my ministry with undp assistance my ministry co-hosted the first national foresight conference where we had all sectors of our economic represented government public and private sector civil society the exercise has today culminated in setting up of our own lab of social innovation this is expected to play a vital role within the public sector the 360 degrees assessment live simulations of concepts and programs addressing issues with foresight reaching to the grassroots through concepts such as idea board are today on track with this development the government will have access to a 28 day window to test an idea through only the most complicated will take additional time i know that 28 days is a far cry from what is practiced in a similar lab in denmark called mind lab where the execution is set to happen within 4 days this indeed gives us benchmark for performance and we will make a note of that sri lanka will now join 20 other countries with similar labs in place and make certain about the potential sri lanka has a significantly high penetration of mobile telephony we have more sims than people 22 million our literacy is one of the best in the developing world 96% and at times prevailed even that of the developing economies these are advantages situations that we need to capitalize on we may not be rich with the traditional resources of the fossil era but are quite rich with resources for the planned blue green era in the ict sector we are becoming world class in few areas and we need to bring the synergy of coding 
genomics and the power of small things called nanotechnology. And this triple convergence is the direction we are taking. We will plan to disrupt not only the perceptions at times that people outside have towards us, but our own internal perceptions that has prevented us from really shooting for the stars. I know we have some significant weaknesses at present. However, our minds are today elevated to a different level with some insights. Even though my background is in law and management, I believe that I am different today with lots of experiences and exchanges that I have had since becoming the Minister of Science, Technology and Research. My task had been to empower and ensure the community to perform and we are trying to do just that. I know our journey has begun. Let us work together and achieve 17 SDG goals by 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I, uh, two quick takeaways from your wonderful intervention. The, the first is to show how the SDGs are resonating so clearly uh, in the country, in the actions that your government has taken at the highest level. And this is something that's not restricted to, to your country. Last week, we had a general debate at the General Assembly in New York, where many heads of government and state came to speak. And we saw that country after country reiterated how much the SDGs are resonating with them. And I think that's a reflection of the challenges the world is confronted with and the opportunities that your country is so well placed to, to seize upon. And the second takeaway is how um, engagement with technological change, with innovation, is really a universal agenda. It's not something that is reserved only for richer countries, but is something that everyone is really taking, taking on. Um, you also mentioned that you have uh, an innovation lab, and part of the things that you're doing in your innovation lab is thinking about the future. And I think that thinking about the future is critical to uh, this whole enterprise of understanding how disruptive technologies will uh, influence the role of, of government. And the, our center here in Singapore, the Global Center for Public Service Excellence, has been doing a lot of interesting work on, on strategic um, uh, foresight. Uh, and we're going to hear now um, from uh, someone that was supposed to join us on the panel, but he at the last moment could not make it, so we recorded a video uh, that we're going to show in a moment. Uh, 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 we're going to hear from uh, Noah Raffer, who is the Chief Operating Officer, and this is a title I would like to have at some point, Futurist in Chief of the Dubai Future Foundation, and for many years has been working with the government of the United Arab Emirates, including advisor the Prime Minister, on, uh, on the future. And has a number of interesting initiatives to share with us. So could I ask that the video be shown, please? Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Noah Rafford, and I am the Chief Operating Officer and the Futurist in Chief for an organization called the Dubai Future Foundation. I was really looking forward to being with you this morning in Singapore, but unfortunately, due to a last minute conflict, which I couldn't avoid, I'm not able to be there with you in person. Instead, I'd like to share this little video with you, which describes some of the activities and initiatives which we're doing in the UAE to help anticipate and create the future. And I hope you'll get in touch with me on my email address, which you can see here on the screen or my Twitter account. And I'll share these with you again at the end of the presentation. I think we'll all agree that we're living in an era of transformational change. Not just transformational technological change, which is driven by increases and in, in advances in artificial intelligence, robotics and automation, but also an era of social change. We're experiencing a growing gap between the rich and the poor, and this is manifesting itself in the form of anger and frustration by those who feel like they haven't benefited from the gains of the last 20 years, and indeed might not have a role to play in the gains of the next 20 years. We see this in forms of protests, both formal in terms of populist electoral politics and informal in the form of street protests and demonstrations, and unfortunately in some cases, violence. 
This is all likely to continue to accelerate and be exacerbated by what many scientists agree to be the beginning of runaway climate change. As the effects of climate change deepen and accelerate, this is going to put more stress and strain on our social, economic, and ecological systems and make the questions which we'd like to explore today in this conference more profound and more pressing. So how do we, as government and civil servants, as public sector employees, how can we help to navigate this change? And not just navigate this change from a way of means of survival, but actually help to facilitate and bring about a more positive and optimistic vision of the world that we would like to live in and like to leave for our children. This is the question that we grapple with here in Dubai every day in the Dubai Future Foundation. And Dubai itself is a great place to be exploring these questions because Dubai uh, is a young city. The UAE itself is quite a young country. It's less than 45 years old. And it's no stranger to change. In the last 45 years, uh, the country has gone from having less than 50 college graduates in the whole country to having one of the highest educational attainment rates in the region, to having one of the highest GDPs per capita in the world, and to becoming a real test bed for integrating the technologies, infrastructures, and systems of the 20th century with the risks, opportunities, and potentials of the 21st century. So at the Dubai Future Foundation, our job is to ask this question. What does the next 20 years look like? If we've seen this amount of dramatic change in the last 20 years, and the rate of change is accelerating, then what do the next 20 years look like? And how can we help the UAE, the region, and the world prepare for it? So we do this through several ways. The first is through large-scale public engagement, and indeed not just engagement, but attempts to, in, to inspire optimistic views of the future, to have rich dialogues around what the promises and potentials of these technologies and these changes and business models and governance structures might hold. Instead of just writing a report, we explore how these fundamental human needs that are primarily the responsibility of the public sector, highly regulated things like education, healthcare, and transportation, how these intersect with technologies such as AI, robotics, synthetic biology, and distributed systems like blockchain. And we do so by creating these immersive interactive experiences, which you can actually walk into you can touch, you can feel, and experience. We've done this now five years in a row as temporary pop-up exhibits at an event called the World Government Summit, which we host each year in Dubai uh, in February. And this has given us the momentum the and the confidence and the experience to build a permanent museum, which is currently under construction right now and will open in summer of 2019. Now, what's interesting about this, and I'd like you to consider, is, is this element of how we approach these questions and how we engage people. Take this example here. This is a fictitious, hypothetical, speculative public healthcare system of the future. But it's not just a beautiful home health experience where as you brush your teeth in the morning and as you brush your hair and get ready for your daily routine, ubiquitous smart sensors scan you and your environment. They link with an AI doctor and with your health uh, history and it provides holistic preventative recommendations for how you might increase your wellness or decrease the risk of disease, but it actually envisions an entirely new system. And it does so in a way which you, anyone really who experiences this exhibit, doesn't even need to know anything about AI. You might not even be a health expert, but as humans, we all experience the experience of getting up in the morning and getting ready for our day, of brushing our hair, of washing our teeth and washing our hands and taking a shower. And by creating this human-centric, immersive experiential approach, which shows how our daily needs, like healthcare, like education, might transform, we're able to not just present an exploratory vision for what the future might be like, but actually a specifically targeted, optimistic one, an optimistic vision which people actually want. This is really engaging. So as a policy briefer, you can spend years trying to brief the public or senior civil, senior civil servants on the ethical questions of big data, the, the social questions around surveillance and who's reading our data. But when you go and experience this in the context of a first person view with you and your mirror, and the thing is scanning you as we demonstrate here, just through a fictitious example of someone scanning their hand to check into their smart mirror in the morning and get a daily checkup, you feel it in your bones. You feel, what would it be like if my mirror was actually looking back at me and evaluating me? And this provokes questions from everyone in society. If you're a public health specialist, if you're a minister, or if you're even just a visitor to this experience, who's scanning me? Who's reading my data? It provokes a 
provokes a visceral, emotional, physical response. This is a far more effective way of engaging people in conversations about the future. But it also generates demand. So take this example. This is a, a classroom of the future, an early childhood classroom of the future. It's a digital sand table that we developed. Uh, it's a fictitious experience. It works there. You can touch it and play with it. But it's based on the latest research on how children learn. We know children learn best in groups, interactive, engaging with different topics and material, by literally getting their hands dirty, by experimenting, not by sitting and learning from a textbook or, or hearing big words about geology or geography or hydrology. So what this digital sand table shows is that you can build up little mountains of sand and digital snow forms at the top of the mountain. If you wave your hand, digital water falls from your hand and creates lakes and rivers. As you dig ditches for the lakes and rivers, it flows together and you begin to develop an emotional, physical understanding in a group of how water interacts in the environment. You begin to understand what geology is like and how it works in ge geography and hydrology and ecosystem science without ever having anyone tell you about it. And this is not only uh, educational and effective, but also it's beautiful. This is an experience that we had in the very first Museum of the Future that we did five years ago, where we're taking the Prime Minister through the exhibit and the Minister of Education. And he looked at me and thought, oh, this is great. I get this. Uh, I'll take 300 of them. I was thinking in my head, like, wait a second, this isn't real. This is about a future classroom. This is fictitious. And he looked at me like I was the silly one. He said, you know, build me 300 of these. And we realized in that moment that this sort of, of experiential future is, is tremendously influential because it develops a vision which people want to see realized. So once you create these bold visions of the future, you have to do something about them. It's not just enough to talk about them, to envision them and visualize them through new media. You actually have to do something. You have to prototype things through experiments and pilot projects. So an example which I'm showing you here, it comes from uh, the role that 3D printing might play in architecture, real estate, and construction. We'd created an industry association in Dubai about two years ago to explore how one of Dubai's major economic sectors, construction and real estate, might be transformed by automation in the form of 3D printing. And out of this group, a uh, joint venture was formed that proposed the creation of the world's first 3D printed building. You can see it here. This is a 3D printed concrete. The walls, floors, and ceilings are all printed. And then we augmented that with different forms of, uh, of interior and exterior architecture. So it became the world's first fully functional 3D printed building. And it was indeed our office for several months. What's interesting about this is not the building itself, but that it's a real world prototype. It's a bold prototype that captures people's imaginations and develops a whole host of tacit knowledge which you can only gain through trying things out. This is a big prototype, but prototypes can be quite, can be quite small as well. The point is, once you create an inspiring vision about the future, such as we do with the Museum of the Future, you have to help realize that vision by creating prototypes, tests, and real world examples. This is what we've done here on the back of the three, opening of the 3D printed office. You can see this here. We work with the, our municipal government to create a 3D printing strategy for architecture and construction. So that commits the city of Dubai to having 25% of all buildings 3D printed by 2030. That means that starting in 2019, you won't be able to get a building permit unless 2% of your building is 3D printed. And we'll increase that target every year 2% until we meet the goal. We've done the same with self-driving vehicles. We have a target of 25% autonomous, of all trips will be autonomous by 2030. That's 15 years from now. I think we're going to beat that. But as far as I know, we're the only city in the world that has such an explicit and aggressive autonomous transportation target. And once you develop these prototypes, once you demonstrate these initiatives, it's important that you then create markets around them to help inspire others to come and want to realize that vision. People such as 3D printing companies, such as self-driving car companies, such as neutral modes of transportation or security. And we do this through several means. The first of which is an example here through a program that we call the Dubai Future Accelerators. This is quite interesting because this is, I think, one of the only accelerators in the world by government which doesn't take any equity in your company. It develops bold challenges for what each government department might face in the coming 10 years. And then it attracts companies from around the world, small companies, small and large, to come demonstrate their technology and spend nine weeks with us developing a pilot project proposal. So this is how we're institutionalizing this process of envisioning the future, 
creating, creating projects and proposals from that, and then realizing them in the form of prototypes. A good example of how we create markets is around blockchain. So after creating the Global Blockchain Council, which was one of the, one of the first and largest multi-party coalitions of banks, regulators, multinational technology companies, and startups around blockchain, we started developing a series of pilot projects. And after developing these pilot projects, the industry came to us and said, what's the roadmap here? What's the way forward? So working on the strategic potential of blockchain, we worked with our partners in the Smart Dubai office and other government departments to create a bold and ambitious target, such as putting 100% of all government transactions on the blockchain by the year 2020. And this is attracting the best and the brightest blockchain enthusiasts and companies from IBM to Microsoft to Consensus to a dozen other small companies to come and help realize this vision. So Dubai in a period of 18 months has gone from being nothing on the blockchain map to being one of the global centers of blockchain development and testing. So these are just a couple of examples to show how we help to work with the public sector, with our partners and other government departments, with the private sector and with the public itself to envision bold, creative, aspirational visions of the future, to test them out through prototypes, to scale them up by creating markets around them, and then to invest in them through direct contracts and direct investment. I hope this has been helpful and useful to you, but regardless of where you are, there's one thing that's for sure. We're gonna experience dramatic disruption in the coming years. From AI to climate change and social inequality, no government is safe. No industry is safe. Nothing is going to be stable. And we can have two ways of approaching this, either a hopeful, optimistic, and experimental approach, or fearful, regressive, defensive approach. And I think that the winners in the 21st century are going to be those who are able to continually experiment and test with test these, tri these trials out and create a hopeful narrative and a hopeful vision, which encourage people to take part in the creation of that future. So hopefully this has been helpful for you. Again, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Please do get in touch with me here on my email address or my Twitter account below. Uh, I regret that I'm not there in person to share some ideas and experiences with you, but thank you so much for your time and attention. I look forward to being in touch with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Noah Raffert, and I am... Wow. 3D construction. I had never heard of anything like this. Who had heard of 3D construction? Oh, I'm way behind then. Uh, can I invite the Honorable Minister, as well as uh, the two panelists, to join me on the stage? Uh, I'll just say a few quick words of introduction, please. So I, uh, Arndt has uh, asked me to emphasize that this is really the session that's going to frame the entire uh, discussion over the um, couple of days that we're going to spend together because it's bringing together the three key themes of the conference, the theme of technology, development, uh, and public service. And so uh, the underlying assumption of a lot of what we've heard already is that technology is already changing our economies, uh, our societies, and eventually it's inevitable that's going to change our governments and our public service. Uh, I want to bring us back to the, to the SDGs to uh, first make the point that technology is going to be essential to achieve the SDGs without seizing on the opportunities that techno technological change is, is presenting to us. It's just simply not going to be possible to meet uh, the SDGs. And I'll give an example of a technology that I think we are unlikely to discuss uh, too much uh, here, which has to do with the technologies linked to energy, the way in which energy is produced. Uh, and I don't know if you, if you are aware, but uh, unsubsidized uh, renewables today uh, are already more efficient than fossil fuel-based means of producing energy in most countries around the world. And this is a result of dramatic changes in technology reflected in drops of prices that have been staggering. So in the last year alone, the cost of solar energy has dropped by 17%, and the cost of offshore wind energy production has dropped by 28%. Over the next few years, there are projections that from now up, up to uh, 2040, 
Uh, it's estimated that about $10 trillion are going to be invested in new uh, means of production energy. And as much as 86% of these are going to be carbon neutral. And this is driven by uh, solar uh, energy, uh, the cost of solar energy dropping by another two thirds between now and 2040, and offshore wind dropping by uh, another 71% between now and 2040. And again, to make the point that I alluded to earlier, this is not a development that is happening only in rich countries. By now, developing countries actually have surpassed developed economies in the share of energy that uh, is globally accounted for in terms of renewables. So there's more energy being uh, produced by renewable sources in developing countries than in developed countries. And th this speaks to this idea that through technology there are opportunities to leapfrog. So uh, these are many examples uh, linked to digital finance. But the point that I wanted to emphasize is that technology, technological change in many areas is going to be critical to achieve the SDGs and presents also unique opportunities, especially for, for developing countries. Technology is also a source of anxiety though, as we heard in the presentation from uh, Noah. Uh, uh, for instance, how it will change the world of work. There's a lot of concern about uh, this point, the jobs that may be displaced. Uh, the way in which it's enabling new uh, ways of undertaking illicit activities and criminal activities. So there's a balance here between the opportunities of technology and the challenges and anxieties it, it creates. So to think it through the public service, one way of thinking through the to this discussion today is to think through basically two aspects. One, how to leverage technology to perform better functions that the service public service is expected to perform already. Uh, but secondly, also, how will the public service need to change to respond to new demands? And I think this is perhaps the most interesting aspect of the discussion that, you, that we can have. And to do so in a way that is not predictable, really. Uh, we have to do it in a way that is characterized by uh, uncertainty uh, and a lot of volatility, uh, again, as we heard from, from Noah. And so should the what should the government stance be in this context? For instance, should they be risk takers? Should be taking on risks that the private actors are not comfortable dealing with? Uh, how are we going to handle uh, issues that fall into gray regulatory zones in terms of who owns data? Uh, what should the stance of governments be? Should, be should, should it be one of being cautious? Should it be one of being encouraging? Or even taking itself risks? in these regulatory gray areas. So these are some of the questions that I would like to, I, won't, I will not answer themselves, I don't have the answer. Uh, so I'm happy to lay them out for you and I will introduce our two panelists and invite them to, to start off uh, with a few reflections on, on, on these two topics, if, if that is okay with you, Honorable Minister. So we'll go first to Vera Kobalia, yes? who has uh, had um, very senior responsibilities in the um, country of, of Georgia, being responsible for the Ministry of, of Economy, and steered the, the Ministry of the Economy and the Economy uh, uh, in Georgia in ways that were remarkable in making great progress in uh, uh, the Doing Business Index, uh, amongst other things, as well as improving the economic performance of, of the country. And she's now advising uh, many other countries uh, uh, around the world um, uh, in doing the same thing, so we're lucky to, to be hearing uh, from you. And we also have um, King Wang Poon, uh, who is the director of the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities, and we've been thinking more about what all of this means in the context of, of, uh, of cities, which is really one of the fundamental challenges that we are confronted with, as you know, a couple of years ago, I believe, the number of people living in cities for the first time in history surpassed the number of people living in, in rural areas, and a lot of the challenges of sustainability will play out in cities. How we deal with the challenge of inequality, how we deal with the challenge of managing natural resources, produce, uh, production of energy, etc. So we're looking very much uh, forward to look, look, uh, hearing from all, all of you. The way in which we're going to do it, we're going to hear first from Vera. Uh, and then from uh, uh, King Wanpun, 
uh, and then we will have a dialogue uh, with the audience as well. So, Vera, please. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction and um, thank you uh, for the organizers for UNDP for inviting me to be a part of this um, very interesting discussion. Um, first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about Georgia, about how we transformed public service in Georgia in the last couple of years, um, in about a decade, and um, what was the role of technology in all of that. So Georgia, for some of you that might not know, is a country um, located in Eastern Europe uh, between Turkey and Russia uh, on the coast of Black Sea. It was part of the um, Soviet Union for quite a few years, but it has a very long history uh, before that. For some of you history buffs, um, you might know the uh, story of uh, Odyssey who um, went to um, take the Golden Fleece, and that story is uh, Medea, and the story of Colchis is uh, historically Georgia. So it has uh, a very long history, but a very uh, difficult history in the last um, uh, 50 or so years, because as I said, it was part of the Soviet Union, and I think most countries that were part of the Soviet Union, they don't have such uh, great recollections of that period. And then um, after the collapse and uh, when we became independent, we went through about 10 years of very dramatic um, uh, civil unrest, uh, civil war, but also um, uh, economic struggles um, to the extent where in 2003, our uh, citizens uh, who were extremely unhappy, especially with the corruption in public institutions, um, but um, in all institutions um, in uh, society asked um, uh, for change. Um, and we had a revolution and a new government came to power. So um, as a result, um, we, you know, as part of this new government, and some of you that attended the uh, Gov Insider um, event a couple of days ago, you heard from the Prime Minister of Estonia. And um, they had, um, uh, very similar, they didn't have a revolution, but they had a lot of similar uh, challenges that they had to de uh, deal with at that period, and we learned a lot from them and from other countries um, uh, in the region. And um, what we understood is that we had to transform drastically um, to provide, to first build trust um, uh, from the public, and then to provide those services because we don't have um, some of the natural resources to sustain the economic growth in the country. So um, we started thinking about public services and how our government can provide better public services and build trust. And the first thing we decided to tackle was uh, corruption in institutions because we realized it was the underlying um, uh, issue behind a lot of other things. And um, the most corrupt institution uh, in Georgia, at least, was the police force. Um, and uh, it was probably uh, the most um, uh, public, I would say, because you would see the, um, the uh, old type of uh, Soviet um, militia, we would call it, but now it's uh, rebranded into police, uh, standing on the sides of the streets and uh, stopping cars and getting bribes for uh, various um, uh, reasons that they could come up with. So it was rated as the most uh, untrusted uh, institution and we were thinking how to, how to transform this institution. Then we realized there was no simple answer. So we just let go, we fired every single policeman uh, in one day. And so we ended up with letting go uh, 25,000 people. Um, and of course, they never voted for our party again. But, um, but what we ended up with was a lot of ha happy people um, that uh, had to deal with them. And we transformed the police force completely with a lot of help for interna from international organizations and from um, other developed countries. And uh, what we ended up with is the police force that was patrolling uh, and not standing on the side of the street anymore and just um, building um, and hired you know, a new police force that believed in uh, what they did, increased their salaries so they could um, 
they didn't have to search for other means uh, uh, for uh, uh, supporting their families and so on and so forth. But then when we started thinking about public services, we realized that um, public service um, uh, had to be also transformed completely. And um, uh, there was a lot of corruption in issuing certificates or licenses or any other document that you could possibly uh, request from a government. And we've heard from uh, Honorable Minister of Singapore a couple of days ago, If I know many of you were at that conference as well, and um, he was talking about moments of life, so looking at public service from, a com from the citizen's perspective. And uh, this is what we were thinking as well, is that how do we start thinking about services for people? And um, we realized that um, uh, we had on the ground a lot of middlemen that were trying to uh, uh, use or uh, have connections with various public officials in order to expedite those services of getting a passport or getting an, uh, the, another document. And we said, well, what are these services that middle, these middlemen are providing? Maybe we can provide those services as a government openly. Um, and we realized that you know, expediting a service would cost X amount of dollars or in our case, Larry. And, um, and we said, well, let's split services, government services, and say openly that for uh, requesting a document in um, you know, uh, 20 days, so if you want to get a passport, for example, in a regular time period, then it will cost you, like, let's say, $5. But if you want it today or tomorrow, then you have to pay $100, and it's official. Um, and, uh, and that worked really well, especially for businesses. Um, and then we also uh, looked at generally how we uh, build the technology behind the back office that provides these services. So um, digitizing everything, introducing, uh, trying to remove as much as possible manual uh, paperwork and um, removing the payment uh, system from uh, uh, directly uh, from the citizen or the business uh, directly with the public official, but introducing online payments, which uh, drastically change the uh, picture uh, as well. So all of this in the end led to us moving from one of the uh, most co corrupt countries on the transparency international list to the, uh, one of the least corrupt countries um, on their list and also led to us moving from one of the most difficult countries to do business in into the uh, number eight on the doing business. Uh, but I think um, what I wanted to highlight is when we talk about technology behind um, all of this, and the uh, transformation continues uh, right now. We are one of the first countries that is uh, has implemented uh, uh, blockchain technology in land registration and um, uh, property registration systems. So the government uh, uh, land registry uses um, uh, the blockchain system and um, um, it's still in the um, uh, starting stages but um, uh, is uh, looking to be a, a, a successful um, uh, project at this point. But, um, and, and how did that come is uh, because we were, we became number one on the doing business of land property registration indicator. So we said, okay, how can we improve even further than that? Um, but behind all of that, um, just to wrap up m my um, first thoughts, is um, where the technocrats or people that were thinking about how to transform public service. And I think um, that, is really the answer because when we're thinking about technology and debating about what future technology for public service looks like, I think we also have to think about um, the people that make decisions to introduce those technologies in the public services. Um, because I work with a lot of uh, countries across the world and in many countries, uh, technologies, even the ones that we have today, are not being used. One example, for example, we're talking about, you know, in some places, such as Singapore, we're talking about smart contracts. Um, but in many places that I work with, uh, uh, we don't even have digital signatures. Uh, still, most of the public officials spend more than 50% of their daily time signing manually documents. And um, uh, so 
when we're talking about public service in 2030 is I think we have to look at the various futures, different futures that might lie there. Uh, it could be a very positive future um, and we might uh, see all these technologies that we saw in the video being implemented, but there are many countries that are still trying to figure out how to introduce even the basic digital uh, procedures in their services. So how do we empower those uh, technocrats to make those decisions, especially in democratic uh, institutions where you have elections every four or five years, where it's very difficult to make long-term decisions um, uh, when you're thinking about election cycles. Thank you, Vera. That was uh, fascinating. Just for you to reflect, maybe in the next round, it's, it's interesting how technology was clearly used to reduce some of the challenges that you faced. Uh, for instance, the digitalization was an important part. But uh, as I was trying to allude to, uh, the use of technology also creates new vulnerabilities. So for instance, to cyber attacks, etc. So how, how can we keep on uh, handling this harms race between uh, uh, you know, responding to the problems of the past and being prepared for the problems of, of the future. Uh, but let me now invite uh, uh, King Wan Poon to share his uh, reflections with us. If that doesn't work, you can borrow mine. Uh, thank you, Pedro, and thank you, Vera, and His Excellency for their earlier sharing. And thank you all of you for being here. I'm from the Lee Kuan Yew Center for Innovative Cities. It's a center that's been set up within a fairly new university in Singapore called the Singapore University of Technology and Design. So two things to keep in mind, the SUTD, Singapore University of Technology and Design, was established in collaboration at MIT to bring about a new, different type of engineering and architectural education that was design-oriented and integrative. And the Lee Kuan Yew Center is the one of two institutions that shares our founding prime minister's name and we're very pleased to be looking at the multifaceted as well as the multidimensional issues that cities face. And we try to bring the multidisciplinary expertise that the university is advocating to try to solve these major challenges. I thought the important thing about today's title of the conference was is disruptive technologies. And if you cut through all the discussions that you read online or you read in any report, what disruptive technologies mean is that the rules have changed. Something has changed, right? And my favorite joke of this when I discuss this with my colleagues as well as with visiting delegates from all around the world is that I think we all know the rules have changed, but we don't know what the new rules are. And that's what we're trying to figure out. And that was why we started a project about three, four years ago uh, as part of a study into the future of cities, future of Singapore in 2040, 25 years down the road. And I personally led a project that looked at the future of work, education, and health care. A reason for that is quite simple. Pedro talked a little bit about worries about work. I think we need to settle that question. And His Excellency talked about human capital development. And you know, what you use to build human capital development is work, education, and health care. So we wanted to study digital technologies because those are going to be one of the key driving forces of disruption either digital technologies themselves or the digital technologies that actually underpin many other technologies. So 3D construction is made possible because of digital printing as well as fabrication. We wanted to understand in detail, so we understand how the rules have changed and what that means for the social institutions in cities and countries that are so fundamental to building our future human capacities. If we do education, health and work well, I think we're going to do a pretty good job to ensure that as many people as possible in our countries and cities will thrive, and our cities as well as our countries and societies will do well. What I want to do is, uh, His Excellency talked about serendipity. Uh, when you do a project like that over three, four years, uh, serendipity is bound to happen. And I will have a story that came out of this that encapsulates everything that we talked about, which I'll use to illustrate what I think are the three or four things that we need to think about in this future of disruption. So you're in the western part of Singapore. Uh, if you imagine taking a car ride or a cab ride, maybe an Uber ride today, about 10 minutes down, you reach this residential new town called Chua Chukang. It's a public housing estate in Singapore. 
And there lives a little seven, eight-year-old boy. His name is Aditya. Uh, very typical Singapore family, lives in public housing, middle class. The mother is Chinese, the father is Indian, very typically Singaporean too. And Aditya is interesting because he likes chess. He's only seven, eight years old. But he's also the youngest member in Singapore's National Junior Chess Squad. And he's also not just the youngest member of the chess squad, he's also the youngest representative in the Asian Junior Chess Competitions in Mongolia last year. Now, I would like to let you know that Aditya's parents do not play chess, and that he only picked up chess two years ago. And so how in the world did he make it into the National Junior Chess Squad and to the Asian Junior Chess Competition in barely two years? Uh, well, as with the young digital natives of today, he turned to the computer. He started playing online against advanced digital uh, chess algorithms. And then when he got a little bit more confident, he started playing with people from around the world. Some of them may be 50 years old while he was six years old, but they didn't know that. They just thought he was some really cool gu chess guru from Singapore. And that's okay, right? You play with people around the world, you get better. And then when it was time to find a chess coach, he found one in Singapore who helped him to navigate the local chess regulations. But there was a problem, you know, sometimes, you know, it's all about chemistry, right? And it wasn't quite responding to the chess coach. So while he knew how to navigate the local chess competitions, his improvements in chess were just coming incrementally. So his parents decided that maybe it was time to turn to the internet. And through serendipity again, they found a coach from overseas who was based in Trichy, India. And through this coach in Trichy, India, his name is Prabha, he managed to, Aditya's chess skills improve by leaps and bounds to the point where he actually made it into the National Junior Chess Squad. I thought you would also like to know that Prabha, the online chess coach from Trichy, India, also has double kidney failure. And he turned to online coaching because he wanted to minimize getting out to the open in case of infection. So he only goes out for dialysis, dialysis treatment. So he turned to teach coaching online and that's how he ended up coaching Aditya. And he does wonderful things for Aditya. He does four things. One is when he can, he will watch Aditya's games when he's playing, either live or online. He will watch them through Skype. And he'll be asking Aditya, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Is this good? Is this bad? So it's a very fast feedback loop. Sometimes, of course, Prabha cannot. He's got other people to coach, right? So he can't watch Aditya's games all the time. So he will get Aditya to record all the games. And then Prabha will then re watch all the games and then he will then discuss the games post-match with Aditya. The third thing that he does is he actually also uses AI algorithms to analyze the chess moves of Aditya. And he makes recommendations accordingly about what you could do and what you should do and how to improve. And the last thing he does for Aditya is that Prabha will download all these past Grandmaster games for Aditya and then he will step through each of the moves that previous Grandmasters have made. The outcome of this is not just that Aditya has made it to the junior chess squad, it's also that he's become somebody who is very much more confident. He was a shy boy. Uh, his parents thought he would never be less shy. But now Aditya is gregarious enough that he actually makes friends with his competitors, right? So, you know, when you hear that often, right? Makes friends with your competitors. Uh, but the important thing is to keep in mind that it's because of this, right? We now have an interesting relationship that's global that has helped somebody in Singapore, helped somebody in India, and we've created a new system of how we think about offering basic services and educational possibilities for our future generation. But what is this telling us? Obviously, the rules have changed. So how have the rules changed? Uh, let me touch on three ways that I think this story illustrates. The first thing is previously, and in many conversations I've had over the years with representatives from all around the world, sometimes they say the thing is, that His Excellency and Vera have mentioned. No, you know, we are not at a different stage of development. You know, we can't afford or do the same things that certain other countries can do. And I think disruptive technologies have changed the rules in one way, which is that what used to be constraints and impediments to innovation and creativity and advancement are now actually opportunities for innovation. Because technology's costs have come down, because technologies have become so proliferated and so widespread. You could be having double kidney failure, you could be a shy boy, you could have nobody at home to teach you chess, but technology can help you to resolve some of those. May not be ideal, but it gets you so much further than where we were before. So technology allows us, especially the disruptive technologies, allows us to turn constraints into innovation opportunities. 
The reason for that is the second thing that I think the way rules have changed. The important thing about digital technologies is that they are general purpose. When you talk a lot about past disruptive technologies, they tend to be specific purpose, right? You know, if you, you can only do this thing with this technology. But digital technologies are general purpose. You could apply AI to many things. And so all that is required is your clarity of thinking about what your policy should achieve and what is the outcome and impact you want to make. And because the costs have come down, you can appropriate these technologies to do whatever you want to achieve the policy outcomes. And I think the third thing that's interesting, and I want to keep that people keep in mind because it's very new, is that you just keep in mind a detailed story. It's an education story at some level. It's a human development story at some level. In the past, we used to think of education as a domestic, inward-looking sort of sector. I can bet with you, if you check your national statistics or your urban statistics, you will see the education sector classified as a domestic sector. It's the same thing in Singapore. What I have just told you, that story, is that actually your education sectors, your healthcare sectors, and I suspect many of your domestic inward-looking sectors and policies now potentially have a global dimension. And if you can have a global dimension to these things, what does it mean for the way you organize your policies, organize your institutions, as well as organize how you draw on the world's expertise to serve the needs of uplifting your citizens as well as the people in your country. So I just want to end by saying, remember our detailed story. Remember the rules have changed. I can't give you an entire book yet about what rules, new rules are, but I think there are three things. One is constraints of opportunities for innovation. Two, digital technologies are general purpose. So keep in mind, you just need to be clear about what you want to achieve for your policies, your initiatives, and your strategies. And third thing is start thinking about your policies as being global from day one. So thank you, and I look forward to having a good Q&A with everybody. Thank you. That was great. The rules have changed. I want to challenge all of us also to think through what hasn't changed and what stays. Because uh, ultimately, there was a need for this interaction with the master. It happened that it could be in India in this case, right? But so, and especially in the context of, of public service, technology can disrupt many things. But what are the, funda maybe for you, Honorable Minister, with your wisdom and expertise, to think through what are the fundamental things that that we need to preserve as well. Uh, we still need, for instance, motivated public servants. Uh, but I won't go to the panel immediately because I want to give the opportunity to uh, colleagues in the audience to ask questions. Uh, and if there aren't any, then I will uh, throw you this question, Honorable Minister. Can I have a show of hands question? Yes, ma'am, please. There's a microphone over there. If you don't mind introducing yourself, and if the question is addressed to a specific member of the panel, to indicate that as well, if possible. I know how to turn it on now. You have to look here at the bottom, and there's a switch. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you to all the panelists. My name's Jane Thomason. Um, I'm from Apt Associates, and I think I'm a digital government pest, so I'm really happy to be here in this room with a lot of people who are thinking about transforming government with disruptive technologies. Um, I guess I'd like uh, perhaps all of the speakers to just um, say, what do you think are the three challenges with, with getting governments envisioned with the possibilities around technology? and three ideas to be able to um, take it forward to a future such as was envisioned by the Dubai futurists. Thank you, that's a wonderful question. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Peter Lovelock, TRPC. And I'd like to echo, <coughs> pardon me, um, Thank you for the, the wonderful presentations this morning. Um, I want to just pick up on King Wang Poon's um, aphorism for or, or collection, collective mantra for that presentation. I think I'm in complete agreement with everything that you say, but particularly given the audience in the room, I think I want to challenge 
the use of the rules have changed. I think what we're talking about is maybe the rules of the road or the regulations, but in many cases what disruption and disruptive technologies are doing are in fact finding new ways to recognise the reality of the situation that's ongoing. We don't necessarily see the rules changing. If I think, for example, of transactions, and what you see right now is the ability to bring together people who, communities who are otherwise financially excluded, who are going about what they are doing, and now we have the reach to be able to encompass and enable what they are all otherwise doing. Right? S similarly, your terrific story about the chess champion in Singapore who's now connecting with the master in India, um, that's not a changing of the rules per se, it's an enablement of something that was already otherwise going to happen, but we can now do it with the, tech, the disruptive technologies enabling it. So I think what we might be talking about there is the business models or the monetization changing. But I, I just want to be careful about rules because we'll have policy makers and regulators here and that strikes a chord with regulation. So I agreed with everything that was said. I'm just a bit nervous about the rules issue. Thank you. That's much better articulated the point I was trying to make about trying to really delineate what is fundamentally new and what is changing and what stays. I think I, we need to go back to the panel, maybe starting with the Honourable Minister first and then uh, Vera. Uh, I think we have focused uh, attention to the, the theme of the uh, conference. Uh, I must thank uh, my colleague panelists for their collaboration on the theme with their uh, experience uh, as individuals and as countries. Uh, I focus attention to three eras, that is of course uh, 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 some centuries ago uh, what we have done. At that time of course those technologies also disrupt at that time. But in the, at present of course what we are doing and in the future what we have to do. So then now at present of course it's true that uh, we are talking about uh, 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 the technologies, how to apply in governance and in business, in the marketing, in every field, the healthcare, education. I think uh, it is, uh, and at the moment, of course, uh, all member countries of uh, 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 United Nations, uh, 192 countries, focusing on uh, 17 SDGs, goals, and 169 targets. But within that, 17 goals, of course, everything covered, I believe, with 169 targets. So then now here we focus our attention to how to apply uh, technologies in governance, uh, keeping in mind the 17 SDG goals. Right. So then, uh, of course, uh, uh, so that is the, that is the uh, challenge we have at the moment because uh, all countries now, if you take them, the, normally we categorize countries into, that is old school theory, developed, uh, uh, underdeveloped, uh, developing, underdeveloped and least developed countries. But now, of course, all we are members and we all focus our attention to 2030. So hardly we have 13 years. Uh, as I said, of course, if uh, uh, at the age of five years, uh, a child uh, entered to the school, now within 13 years, I think, is a young man or uh, about with 18 years or 19 years. So by that time, of course, when he completes the education, the school education, the general education, of course, then he should be, he or she should be in a position to adapt to uh, the situation uh, in 2030. So, the, uh, so then that, if, if we keep in mind, of course, we have to uh, uh, reform our education as I said, uh, the STEM education is directly involved with the technology, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I find the, the, uh, the last year PISA uh, assessment, uh, Singapore came first. 
out of 72 countries. So when we, all other countries will fight, then this will be a role model. So then uh, on the other hand, of course, we have to in, uh, uh, build the capacity of uh, the mainly the public servants. Now some are in their retiring age, some are in the middle, some are young. So then, of course, we have to build the capacity to meet the challenges by 2030. So in that case, of course, then we have to improve their uh, 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 ICT uh, education, digital uh, technology, and thing how to apply this uh, digital uh, 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 in healthcare, uh, in education, in governance. And not only that, our main focus should be uh, 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 should be the uh, elevation of poverty. Number one of uh, SDGs. So then we have challenges then with the climate change. So that is why we uh, uh, we ratify the Paris Agreement in most countries. Uh, so then with the climate change, now for an example in Sri Lanka, uh, last three seasons uh, we didn't have adequate rain. Then as a result of course our uh, uh, paddy uh, production went down by 50 percent. So we had to import rice uh, about 250,000 by now. Still we are facing another part of the country with severe drought and then we hit 13 districts, about 1.8 million people. On the other hand, on the southern <coughs> part, unusual uh, 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 rain. So within 24 hours, 552 millimeters rain fall. So they <laughs> washed away. Uh, the, the uh, low country uh, 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 plantations uh, in ba it's badly affected about uh, over uh, 7,000 houses damaged partly or fully. So those are the things that we have to focus on. It's how, we go on how we are going to apply science and technology uh, with the governance to overcome these issues that is especially the food security that is number one. So then like that, of course, then we can continue. Uh, uh, in our country, of course, uh, uh, some years ago, of course, we, uh, we have digitalized, you know, uh, the governance at divisional level. As I said, even at the <coughs> grassroots level, the village, we have 14,400 villages. For each and every village, we have, an example, uh, the midwives at that level. So then now they are using tab. So everything in their tab, of course, they communicate with, you know, uh, PHIs, the MOH officers, and the hospital. So then you can get the first hand information with no time. Even the farmers, as I said, of course, we have uh, more uh, cell phones than the population. Then the farmers in rural areas, they use uh, their uh, cell phone or iPad. Then they have all the information when they are, going, uh, when they are getting uh, rain, the drought, and the prices of, the, of their productions in cities, so they're getting so then it is easy for the government officials to uh, uh, address their issues because we have all this information in their hand. So that is why I say that in governance, of course, when we apply technology, then of course we have to, uh, we, have, we must have awareness programs, we have to reform education, build the capacity, and then apply. Thank you. I think you put the, the emphasis on this idea of volatility, of us living in a volatile world and how do we de deal with shocks, climate shocks and others. Uh, and I think it's very relevant for the discussion we're having as well. Let me hand over to Paola. Oh, yes. Um, so uh, to the question about uh, the challenges, I think um, we are very good at um, and I probably speak for us in the room, so the ones coming from public service or politicians or um, uh, in planning. So we know what needs to be done, but then we j oftentimes have challenges in implementation on the ground. So um, if you look at many developing countries, at least in my experience where I've worked, is um, it's n many solutions are out there. It's not really that difficult to figure out and there are many best practices that can be um, 
uh, taken and, and um, uh, molded for uh, local uh, uh, practice. But, but then there are huge challenges on the ground with implementation and that creates a lot of disparity. So um, I think one of the issues is due to our short-term thinking. Um, we tend to, um, as people, but also as um, public servants, to think in specific periods of time and what we can um, ach um, uh, attain or achieve in those periods of time. Um, so as people, we tend to think in, uh, in our lifespan. So from birth to death, what I can achieve. And then as uh, public servants, we tend to think in our um, so for politicians elected period of times, and it could be four to five years, or it could be a bit longer for some or shorter for some. And it's a very short period of time to make decisions and to try to, try to solve issues such as climate change. How do you start thinking about issues of climate change um, uh, when you're just thinking even in the lifespan of one person? So I think that's one thing that we need to uh, transform our mental mentality into thinking further than that and long term. And I think historically we were thinking like that, but we've become much more hyper reactionary, um, especially especially now in the age of uh, you know um, uh, technology um, and. Um, uh, as they say, in Industry 4.0 and so forth. So I think, um, uh, and then one, I think, very interesting solution that I saw recently was um, uh, on climate change. So how do we convince some of the politicians or public servants to make decisions that um, uh, affect policy towards mitigating climate change? And it's very difficult to talk to your uh, citizens in developing countries about climate change unless they see it firsthand. Farmers are usually one of the first that to start thinking about it. But even uh, that, when you have challenges with um, uh, poverty or uh, uh, lack of uh, electricity or any other issues that many countries have, where you start talking about climate change and it's just not a priority, it's not on the top 10 list. So how do you get politicians or public servants to start thinking about it more proactively? And I saw this um, case where um, uh, a group of um, uh, people, they have a laboratory where they try to create the future. Um, and what they do is they build a room um, these scientists, they build a room where they try to replicate uh, how a future might look like in 30 years or 50 years time. And they did this for Dubai government. And what they did is they were talking about uh, regulations and policy about um, uh, uh, electric cars and just trying to reduce the number of uh, traditional cars that are on the road. And they told the story where some of the um, public servants were saying, well, it's just impossible for me to change my habits right now. I cannot tell my son to just stop driving uh, uh, you know, his car. And what they did is they, they created um, uh, air, these lab scientists, they created air that might smell like um, the air you're going to um, uh, observe in 30 years time or 50 years time. And just the stench and the, 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 the smell and the, even the color that filled the room um, was so drastic that had a real strong effect on the people that were in the room. And they all of a sudden realized exactly how it's going to feel like at the moment in time and what they will have to experience on a daily basis. And that, um, based on those sciences, really triggered their mindset to start making decisions, uh, different decisions today. I think that again emphasizes this idea that we need to see how technology can be leveraged uh, along with what we know about human behavior, behavior science, uh, and how we combine the two in ways that changes behavior towards more positive outcomes. King Wang. So I, I think uh, Pedro's question was related to the gentleman's question, which is that what has changed and what has not changed. I think it's a very important point. I'm glad you brought it up. The way we go about executing and implementing how we govern in cities and countries can, has changed because we can do it differently and do it better with disruptive technology. But the fundamentals of why you govern and the fundamentals of governance have not changed. 
which ultimately, you know, this, since we're in Singapore, which uh, our founding prime minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, said, ultimately it's about taking care of the people. And here I'm going to be a little mischievous because I think it's quite coincidental that one of the things, diagrams that first stuck in my mind about what it means to make technologies work for people is actually an old UNDP report from 2001. It's a UN uh, Human Development Report. It's called Making New Technologies Work for Human Development. And there they talked about the role of technologies as doing two things. One is enabling human capabilities, and two is enabling economic growth that provides the resources that we can then invest in the policies and programs to do, do build human capabilities. And what are human capabilities they talked about? To have a good job, to be able to send children to good schools, to live healthy lives, to be able to participate in the social, economic, and civic life of the country and the city. So I think what hasn't changed is the governance part of it, but what it does mean is now we can begin right, to do it differently and better. And so with that, I'll link it to Jane's question. Um, His Excellency and Vera has talked about how we can help the general population or students understand what the future might be. In our own report, in our own studies, we've also shown how potentially with new digital technologies, which I'm not going to today, we can actually link the UN SDG goals to things that they learn in school and things that they can actually participate every day. Maybe it's just five minutes every day, right? but that five minutes every day adds up. Right? So in a nutshell, what it is is we can incorporate the UN SDG into the way that we live our lives, be it the way we're educated or the way we choose to participate and volunteer in society. That might become an interesting way over and above everything that we're doing now, outreach, education, public communication. In short, the challenge I put out to the audience might be this idea that can you make caring for the SDG a value system in society? I think if you can do that, it would be quite interesting. And maybe that's a challenge we should put to work for ourselves. Thank you. That's, that's great. Um, it, it makes me very happy to hear the references to the UNDP uh, Human Development Report. I, that was about the time I joined. And we are never quite sure if these reports are read or have an influence. So I did. I read it. I hope this is on the record, <laughs> and I'm going to use it. <laughs> Uh, I think we are about to close, but we have time for one more question. Yes, sir, a colleague from India. It's here at the bottom. At the bottom. Oh, that might be different. Hello. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm from India from UNDP India, and I have a question which is uh, at three different points. One is we talk of SDGs and we say we need to think of, the first pr uh, principle is not to leave anybody behind. And we are talking of people, and here I'm talking of people who are completely illiterate. They are in the rural areas. They've never seen technology as such, never interacted with it. The second point which I want to talk about is the governance part, which is the policies and the rule of law, which is already there, archaic, very, very difficult to change. And the third is the behavioral aspect, which uh, she really talked about very nicely, and I really like that idea of how to change. So my question is, when I'm hearing about Dubai, when I'm hearing about Singapore or Georgia or Estonia, we are talking about an audience which is highly educated and we are talking about improving public service for those people who are really able to access it well. Uh, what would you suggest one should begin when we are talking of these three points? When we have to focus on those people who just do not have even the wherewithal to access technology or operate technology and they are very uneducated, where would you begin out of these three points? That's a great question to conclude our panel. Um, oh, you have a question? It has to be really quick. Hi, very quick question. Um, my name is Sean from Zeroth Labs. We're an urban innovation lab. So uh, has anyone here watched The Expanse yet? It's like, no, really? The UN is like one of the most sexiest actors in the, in the whole show. It's an, uh, an extraordinary show. 
Um, so we talk about futures, and I thought that you know they have the production budget to actually create very compelling ones. And it's a, actually a story of when uh, humanity is now an uh, interplanetary uh, civilization. Uh, the UN clearly represents Earth, you know, as opposed to Mars. Um, so <clears throat> in this story, um, it, it shows a future where the UN is, is, makes all the elite uh, policy making decisions for Earth and bargains for us. And more importantly, the future is where universal basic income, as people may talk about today, is everywhere. It's fantastic, it's everywhere. But you know, contrary to how most people talk about um, universal basic income, they call it basic, as is the colloquial term, and as that might, term might make you understand, it's a lot like living on state welfare now. And the thought that a lot of people associate with universal basic income is that once you're on it, ta-da, everyone's gonna become artists, and everyone's gonna, you know, human potential unleash. In the show, people are actually selling trinkets at markets because they actually don't have that much money to begin with. And they're taking, honestly, the question is, what is, that's a horrible future. That's a dystopia. It's very easy to talk about the utopian vision uh, that King talked about just now. Um, where is the difference between these two? What are, the, what are the challenges that need to be addressed in order to make the utopian vision more likely to happen than the dystopian one, which honestly feels like it's more likely right now? That's my question. First question, uh, you're right, Singapore is a different stage of development. Uh, we do have a group in Singapore. Oh, it's not audible. Is there? Okay. So there is a group, there is actually a group in Singapore that could potentially be left behind, and we're talking about the folks in their 70s and 80s who did not live through the dot com era, and for them, you know, they still get news, sometimes in dialects, from national broadcasters. And I think the idea there is there are two possible solutions. One is the Singapore government and civil society had no choice but go door to door to explain policies to them in the language that they understood. We might have no choice but to do that. And you know, this is about potentially using digital means to mobilize enough people to do that volunteering. And so it's the use of technology indirectly. The other thing that it's just as a thought to leave in mind is that every time I get also this question that the elderly don't get I always point to that 70-year-old person who's on the public subway system who's playing mahjong on the iPhone. And I say, you know, they, can, they get technology, they're watching Korean dramas on, on the iPhone, but it's about how you design the technology. And I think there's probably a need at some point, either international or societal or company or corporate social responsibility to think about how do you design for what I call the extremes. And sometimes when you design for the extremes, there are possibilities for the mainstream as well. So I think those are two areas that I think we can certainly explore. And maybe the question about dystopian future, we did worry about that as well in the work that we do. And we've provided a few examples of how we can actually get people from a dystopian future to a, a slightly more positive one. I think utopian is dangerous too, uh, in, in, in some respects. So we can discuss that a little bit more. Two quick ideas. One is you have to get society to be helping each other. And I think if you look at the younger generation, they're all very interested in helping doing things for society. We're really not passing, harnessing that well enough. I complain a lot in Singapore, we have an educated population, but the way we engage civil society, the way we engage the younger generation, is still so 1990s, you know, even 1980s, right? And, you know, so we have not quite thought through that. The other way is specifically to the future of work, uh, just to leave a thought with you, the most balanced report that talk about the future of work is that automation do not does not remove job, job by job. They remove task within job, task by task. If you think about it, if one task gets disrupted, it doesn't mean the whole job gets disrupted. And every task that's being substituted, the technology could be complement to another task. And you can actually increase the value of the other task. You can actually create a much better job and a more meaningful job for the person. I know it sounds a bit conceptual, but in the interest of time, I won't go into detail, but you're happy with that. Thank you. Uh, 
You're absolutely right on this point of tasks and occupations. There was a study that uh, was recently uh, published that showed that the only occupation that was lost in the United Nations between 1950 and today was elevator operator. <laughs> All the other occupations remained, but as you correctly said, some tasks have been uh, disrupted. Yes, ma'am. And just to add to that, um, I just recently saw a report done in Australia um, where um, they looked at tasks versus jobs and how in the future, how the jobs will change and what kind of tax, tasks will be removed and how they will be replaced with other tasks. So um, I can't remember the name of the report. It's done by um, Alpha Beta, so you can look it up. Um, but in terms of... Um, uh, the first question that was asked by the gentleman from India, I think that, um, of course, education, uh, but long-term answer. So I think we have to make our uh, governments more accountable, system more accountable for um, the uh, job that they're doing on a daily basis. Um, so, uh, and I think technology could be an answer to that. So I've, I was speaking recently to my colleagues in Mexico, and they were saying that uh, in Mexico, 96% of public officials um, are in their jobs because of um, uh, jobs because of um, uh, friends or acquaintances. So, so there is a lot of nepotism in the um, public service there. So you can imagine it, to them it's very difficult to co talk about you know, accountability on the larger scale when they are accountable to others that have uh, uh, provided them the position and so forth. So I think how can we need to start thinking about it and using technology to make our politicians or public servants more accountable um, to people. And, um, and then there's a lot of work being done uh, right now. I'm part of the uh, Young Global Leaders Group at the World Economic Forum and there is another group there that's called Global Shapers. And these young um, bright minds, they're all under 30 and they are coming up, they become very distrustful um, about their um, uh, institutions mainly and, uh, and how they're trying to solve it is build uh, technologies, various applications and, and programs that can be utilized to um, uh, make uh, politicians more accountable. So, um, and uh, in terms of universal basic income, I think that that's, a, uh, that's being debated a lot. There is an OECD study that just was published a couple of months ago that um, uh, uh, debates actually, and uh, um, uh, the conclusions are that actually it's not such a uh, perfect um, a solution maybe to uh, in many countries, but as you know, Canada and some of the Scandinavian countries are um, testing it uh, more on um, uh, provincial or uh, uh, local level. So um, we'll uh, we'll have to uh, live through it and, and see what happens. But um, uh, as I said, we have to imagine many different futures and uh, imagine how those futures are for uh, not only uh, countries such as Singapore, but also for uh, many other uh, developing countries that might be struggling with just basic uh, technological solutions at, the, at this point. Thank you, Vera. I did such a bad job at managing time, right? That Max will never invite me again to moderate the, the session. But Honorable Minister, briefly, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, uh, Actually, the first question uh, referred to the literate society, governance, and behavioral aspects. All these three interrelated. Uh, first of all, I think uh, to have a literate society, of course, we have to improve education and uh, teaching methods and the machine to be present and the people to be present. Uh, I think even in India, I can remember, uh, when I was the chief minister of the Western province in 1995 2000, uh, similar at the same time, uh, the Chief Minister of the Andhra Pradesh, uh, then Chief Minister Chandra Babu Naidu, is the person who introduced uh, uh, ICT in governance, and he converted the entire his uh, 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 fellow councillors first, uh, and then uh, entire public service. So then I think there are some examples, but it <coughs> vary from country to country, and the society to society. 
So then you can't introduce one formula for all the countries. So it all depends on uh, uh, the uh, process. That's right. Then, then the second question, of course, the income, then uh, human potential, and the European vision. That, of course, but uh, we all, as nations, of course, focusing on 17 SDGs. Right? So that is, in a, in a way, of course, uh, uh, that's the second cycle. First, I can remember from 2000, 2015, MDG goals. I think uh, most of the countries uh, achieved the targets of MDG, especially the Sri Lankan, of course, we achieved most of the MDG goals. Now we are in the uh, period, era of 2015-2030. Uh, so, so we have another 13 years, of course. So then we must try hard and then uh, uh, we must uh, take policy decisions or the policy makers and drive uh, uh, nations and individuals towards targets. That is, I think, best way to do it. And then with the, uh, the changing technologies day by day, now, for an example, uh, I can remember the recently one of uh, the professors that I see in his career uh, came to Sri Lanka to deliver a keynote uh, a speech at SIMA, the uh, annual general meeting, and then it is reported in the newspapers. You think by 2030, you don't find the profession called accountant with the addition of artificial intelligence, of course. So then that job is done by uh, the computer. And then now in, in the surgery, uh, in developed countries, they use robots doing uh, minor operations. But very soon, as the research is going on in UK, uh, to my knowledge, that even the bypass operations will be done by robots. And the surgeon's job is limited. So this is the nature of the uh, techno sciences and technology uh, in the future. So then we have to adapt to that. Thank you very much, Honourable Minister. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, I will not uh, really make a concluding statement because Arndt is, is there looking at me. I'll just say that uh, I think it's fair to say that some rules have changed. Fair? Some rules have changed. And uh, the objective during the rest of the conference is to try to understand how we can harness technology to enable us to enhance the uh, performance and the capabilities of the public service, adapting to the, those rules that have changed and being more effective in undertaking those activities that we have to do and that have not changed fundamentally <coughs> in the public service. So let me ask all of you to give a warm round of applause to our panelists.